Hi everyone that made it here from the fashion show. I'm, I'm going to stall a little bit for people to still come in. Um, and let me stall by first uh, thanking my co-author Ulrich Reitefuch, who was a brainchild on uh, this entire project is and um, Sadly, he can't be with us uh, today because he got his uh, second uh, vaccine jab and is now recovering from that. Uh, but I hope that I will do all his ideas justice and present them here. Um, if you do want to reach out uh, to Uli with any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to shoot him an email. Um, of course, you can also shoot me an email or please find me on Twitter. Uh, if you use that. Um, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands uh, in the Computer Graphics and Visualization Group, while Uli is a researcher at Freie Universität Berlin. So with that, let me get started into our presentation on approximating logarithmic spirals by quarter circles and basically this entire presentation is really only set up to finally arrive at a spot where I can explain this picture to you, or ideally I don't have to explain it to you because after the presentation, it all comes naturally together and you clearly understand how this picture came about. All right, so for some uh, motivation, uh, let's first uh, focus on this term logarithmic spirals. And I brought you here some uh, some more or less logarithmic spirals from uh, nature, maybe. So here you see a Nautilus shell, um, you see the uh, spiral arms of a galaxy, uh, you see the famous uh, Romanesco broccoli, you also see um, a uh, typhoon, uh, the eye of a typhoon with its uh, spirals arming out, and here on the right hand side you see the famous Mandelbrot set. All these uh, exhibit these more or less logarithmic spirals. And so now, how would you tackle these spirals? How would you formulate these spirals in a mathematical manner? Well, you can parametrize them with the following way. So here you have a parametrization, which uh, T gives you the point of the spiral. And there's really one parameter here that goes into the parametrization. This parametrization winds outwards from this center point of the spiral. And if you look closely, I'm going to vary this A value now. If you look closely, you will see that there's a fixed point on the x-axis. So you can see that this point here is not actually moving while the spiral is um, expanding outwards or the inner part is expanding inwards, keeping this point fixed. We let that run for a little bit and it will stop at a point. Have to have that run a little bit. It will stop at a very particular spiral at the famous one, namely the golden spiral. Why is it the golden spiral? Well, it uses the golden ratio. There is a very well-known approximation of this golden spiral using the golden ratio. And let me, all remind, let me remind you all on how this approximation comes about. So you start with your favorite golden rectangle and um, the golden rectangle has this one property that you can split it into a square. And the leftover will be another golden rectangle, just scaled down. Cool, so we have a square. What can we do with the square? We can draw a perfect quarter circle into the square, all right? We are left with this second golden rectangle. So let's uh, split that again into a square and a smaller golden rectangle. Oh, we have a square, so we can draw as a quarter circle. We have another golden rectangle, so split and put a quarter circle, split and put a quarter circle, split and put a quarter circle, and so on. You see, this construction does give you something that resembles a spiral, 
And it actually is a really good approximation of the golden spiral. In this picture, I show you the actual golden spiral and it's in the background here, it's this light blue golden spiral and the approximation by quarter circles is in front in black. So it's pretty solid approximation. One thing to notice is that here, this was the original golden rectangle that we started with. And we have these two diagonals here. This is the one from this a uh, larger golden rectangle, and this is the one from the second golden rectangle that we saw. And these two meet in a single point here, which is coincidentally the culminating point of the spiral. All right, so we have these two diagonals, and they seem to carry a lot of information. So um, the main idea here is why not invert the construction and start from the diagonals? Cool, let's do that and let's see what happens. So we start with these two diagonal lines um, and the only thing we do here is uh, pick a slope. So they are perpendicular, it suffices to pick one slope and this slope I'm going to call S and it's going to be um, the slope of this first line and then there's a second one perpendicular to that. What we do then is we pick a single point on one of these diagonals. Um, let's do this one. And technically now we would pick a direction, but I want a spiral that's spiraling inward. So I'm going to start from this point and I'm going to the right. And I'm going to shoot a line all the way until I reach the other diagonal. So here we go, shot a line. And I'm going to mark this point and I'm going to turn 90 degrees and shoot down to the other line that I set. There we go. I'm going to continue that fashion a little bit. So shoot again, shoot again, shoot again, shoot again, shoot again, and shoot again. Now once more. All right, so you can imagine how this continues at infinitum, but I think we have enough here um, to have an idea of how this construction works. All right. One other thing we would do now is we continue each of these line segments onto a previous line segment. So whenever we shot and there's another line segment inside, we simply continue these lines. So let me show you what I mean by this. So we have this line here, and we're going to continue it to follow through to the next one. But we do the same thing for all the others. This one continues through all the way to here. This one continues all the way through here. This one all the way to here and so on, right? So you always shoot onto the next line segment. Well, this is fun now, right? Because now we do start to see rectangles and we do start to see that apparently here is a larger rectangle that's split by a line into smaller rectangles that are split into smaller rectangles. So that does carry a lot of notion of what we saw before in this construction with the golden rectangle, except for now, we can basically by the slope of these lines decide for the scaling factor between these rectangles. Ooh, cool, cool, cool. But, um, one problem that we have here is in the case of the golden rectangles, we split into one square and one rectangle. And then the square, it was super obvious how to draw a quarter circle. This is not a square. So how would we draw the quarter circles? Well, let's explore that a bit. So here's a little bit zoomed out version of what we just drew. And what we want to draw is a quarter circle. So let me just draw a quarter circle and then we're going to bother how that came to be. So here's a quarter circle. Um, let's think about what do we know about this radius of the quarter circle? Well, uh, we know that um, this, qu uh, this quarter circle of radius r, if we draw the next one, let me do this. So here's another quarter circle. They should have 
a common tangent, a, a, a common tangent and a common point here, right? So um, let's fix this property. These two quarter circles should have the same tangent, all right? We did fix this slope S of the line. So we want to have a scaling from this larger quarter circle to the next smaller one by factor S. That's what we fix it. Cool. So that means that if this quarter circle, this left one has radius R, the right one should have scaling factor S times R. All right, what else do we know? Uh, cool, uh, we know that this box that we have here, this rectangular box has a length B. And since these boxes come about from the same scaling repetition, this smaller box here that arises from splitting and having a smaller box should have length, side length SB. Let's continue that for a second. Splitting again, fixing on this smaller box. So this length here should be S square B because we went from this B box to the S B box to the S square B box. Cool. This is really good because now what did we uh, derive? We have a relation here. Now we can say something about the radius R and these scaled versions. We know that R has to be the same as SR plus S square B. We can actually derive a formula for R here, um, but in a sense that's unpleasing, right? Because everything we did so far was a geometric construction. So me giving you an algebraic formulation is not super satisfying. However, let me show you how we can actually geometrically construct this radius. And here's how we're going to do it. Uh, first, we have to somehow find this length, SB, on this vertical line. And that's easy. We just take our compass. We're going to draw a quarter circle here, right? So, so from this point down here is now a length of SB. And now what do we have? We have here a length B, and here we have a length of FB. Let me mark this by a line. And now all we need to do is use the intercept theorem, right? Because B relates to SB just as R plus SB relates to R. And there we have it, the intersection of this line through our intersection point here, and the uh, elongation of this line meet in the point where we need to start our radius. And thus, we have constructed it geometrically. Let me just remove all the clutter and uh, have you marvel at this a little bit, right? So. Uh, we thought about how to get the radius of this larger quarter circle. Uh, we got it from the simple geometric construction, starting at a rectangle two steps ahead in our uh, construction, building this quarter circle, doing a simple line, and taking the intersection. All right. This tells us how to do this radius, but since all these uh, rectangles are self similar, we can actually con um, continue this construction and thus build more of these quarter circles. And the end result looks something like that, where you have one quarter circle, the next one, the next one, the next one, and so on. All right. So we have taken this construction from the golden rectangle, approximating the golden spiral. And we built an approximation of an arbitrary logarithmic spiral. And now we can build this entire zoo of approximations. And um, let me show you some animals in this zoo. So here, uh, I'm always giving you the slope of this uh, diagonal, or uh, well, the, the S value, because the diagonal have negative, has negative S value. So here's S equals one third, here's S equals half, S equals three fifths, uh, one over square root of 
two, and you see how this getting like um, smaller and smaller, or the winding starts to or roll up around this combination point. Uh, so here's one over the fourth square root of three, and one over the fourth square root of two. And these last two are particularly interesting because um, let's let's fix on this one for a second. This one scales by exactly one third on a full clockwise turn. Why is that? Because for each um, quarter circle, we scale by this factor. So for four quarter circles, a full turn, we have a four, uh, the power of four of this uh, scaling. So in a full turn, we get one third. Similar fashion here, in a full turn, we get a scaling of one half, while these scale very, very much faster in a sense. Uh, you see that the approximations are fairly good, um, except for these um, first quarter circles you maybe see in these two pictures right here in the uh, scaling by factor one third. You see that the original, which is shown in light blue here, is scaling, uh, is, is deviating uh, quite a bit from this first quarter circle, but this deviation is um, gone basically in the later parts. So it is really reasonable and um, good approximation of these logarithmic spirals. So what uh, can we do with that? And the question is always, can we do better? And maybe can we start and approximate a better golden spiral, better than the traditional? And um, where does this better come from? Well, the better golden idea comes from this observation. If you start with your golden rectangle, having side length one and side length a golden ratio on this side, and you split it into the square, as we've seen before, and um, a smaller golden rectangle, then this is useless. Useless in the sense that it doesn't contain the golden ratio anymore. Why do I do a golden ratio construction if this doesn't even have the golden ratio? So I can basically toss this away do the same thing, I get another useless uh, square. So most of this in the uh, geometric construction ends up being useless. Useless is not my wording here, it's the wording of Doug McKenna, who introduced these better golden constructions in the uh, Proceedings of Bridges 2018. So if you haven't seen that paper, I highly recommend it. Uh, look it up. It's a great read. Um, please, please, please look that up. Anyway, to remedy the situation of not, or in order not to lose uh, an entire uh, square to be useless here, uh, Doug introduces what he calls the better golden rectangle. And this better golden rectangle is great because you can split it in three self-similar rectangles that all keep their same uh, ratio intact throughout the splitting process so you don't cut off the useless part. Oh, but what do we see now, right? We see another scaling factor here, square root of pi, which is great. So uh, let's use this one as our slope value and let's use this one in our construction. And here we go. Here's a better golden spiral approximation using our diagonals and uh, the a procedure I've shown you with the rectangular nesting. Cool. So we have a we have seen a golden spiral, an approximation of the golden spiral. We now see a better golden spiral. So the obvious question is: is there a relation? Can we morph one into the other? And uh, yeah, sure we can. Uh, let's start with this image and let me talk you through this because I, I think, and I'm so grateful um, to the reviewers asking a lot of questions about this because I think otherwise we wouldn't have this great image, the animation I'm about to show you here. So if we have this one spiral and we want to transform it into the other spiral, we basically have to transform the scaling value from phi to square root of phi. So we basically have to um, introduce this um, 
uh, sort of halving of the angular momentum. So we want to squeeze the angle by a factor of uh, two or a factor of a half. If we just do this by polar coordinates, this would entirely rip our picture apart. So what we do is we take a pair of scissors and we cut the picture along this white line here. And then we fold it open from there. And here, how that looked like. So we cut it open and then we fold it open from there. And let me point you out a couple of things that are going on in this animation, because it's quite complex. Um, so we, we cut this thing, and uh, then we open it up. And I'd like you to focus first on this rectangle, namely this line in this rectangle. And note that this line is not changing at all, right? This is the fixed point of the parameterization of the re parameterization that we chose. So we have one line in this rectangle that just stays fixed in this squeezing of the angle. And now I said going from one spiral to the other, we needed to uh, half the angle. So this guy and this guy were originally at a 90 degree angle to each other, but here in this final product, we had a 45 degree angle. Let's pick another one. This guy is opposite to our fixed point. So it ends up all the way down here at a 90 degree angle and angles now always with respect to this origin, this culmination, right? And you can check basically any other of these, um, these rectangles. You can think of the angle that it has. Let's maybe do one more. Let's do this one because they're both on the same line. So it's a 360 degree angle and it ends up on the other side of the origin. So the angle gets halved and this guy going to 180 degree around the origin with respect to our fixed point. Okay. So that's what's going on in our reparameterization here. And once we are at the end of the reparameterization, we have all this white space. Interesting question now. Okay, so this white space looks very familiar. It, it looks like you can fill it with something. It looks like you could fill it exactly with the same spiral construction. You can fill it with an exact copy of that spiral, just um, rotated by 180 degree in this case. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so, in a sense, what we did was arbitrary here, right? We chose to transform the better golden spiral into the golden spiral by taking a, the squeezing factor of one half, but no one forces us to do so. We, we can basically introduce any squeezing factor. And um, yeah, that's what we did. So we chose um, another squeezing factor here. And let me show you this final image. Here we chose a squeezing factor of one third. And lo and behold, we get one third of the image filled by the original. And then we get two places for spiraling copies. So uh, this is our final artwork that we uh, created. Uh, we named it Seahorses in Play because the spirals are really reminiscent of uh, seahorses. And um, given this maritime name, we chose a corresponding maritime color palette. And with that, I'd like to uh, once again thank my co-author uh, for this super fun project that we had. Um, as I said, here are contact details. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, or if you have them now, uh, just shoot and ask. And uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, so just uh, unmute yourself and, and ask a question, if you'd like. Yeah, I, I put one in the chat. Um, I, I looked at these golden spirals some time ago. The earliest example I could find of an approximation to a golden spiral with quarter circles was in 1942, which surprised me. Does anybody know an earlier one? 
everybody thinks it's ancient. I could not find an earlier example. I'm not aware. Uh, is anyone aware of? Uh... We we can otherwise take this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something to think about. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks for the. Uh, I think there's one more question in the chat asked by Dave. Mm -hmm. Uh, he asked, um, when you first drew R on slide 31, how did you choose the length? It looked like R did not go through the first leftmost point. Uh, and that is exactly right. Um, so I um, let, me, let me just go back to that slide. So when I first drew R, I did it with the knowledge of, of so, so you mean when I drew this, this quarter, quarter circle, uh, I guess. Um, then, then I drew this with the knowledge of where it should go. So really what you should imagine is uh, me doing this, um, uh, these, these observations and doing this geometric construction because drawing this quarter circle here is completely independent of any of the observations we did. I, I do have this length given by the rectangles that we built. So I can draw this quarter circle by a compass. And now this up here is a corner of the rectangle and I can draw with a ruler, I can draw this line through this intersection point of this quarter or this circle um, and this line and, and this, uh, this point. And so I get this line and I can just um, draw another line through these two corners of the rectangle. And then I know that the starting point of the circle that I want to draw is going to be here. And it also gives me the radius of the circle. So, so in a sense, I cheated by drawing this. Um, and yes, the observation is uh, entirely correct that these um, quarter circles don't go to the points. And it would be fun to explore a little bit like so what, what values of S you actually do hit the points, how many of those points you hit. Um, there's, there's lots of fun, fun things to explore. Uh, but yeah, uh, you're, you're entirely correct. Oh yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, let me go back to this final artwork because I like it so much. Are there any other questions? Um, Lena asks, perhaps I missed it in the beginning, but I would love to know how you got the idea for this, for this project. Actually, <laughs> fun story. The idea came from, from this paper of, of Doug McKenna um, introducing the uh, better golden ratio. And uh, our, our thoughts were, okay, so you do have uh, this, this very classical construction of the golden spiral from the golden rectangles. Now, if Doug introduces a golden better rectangle, uh, or a better golden rectangle, pardon, should there also be a better golden spiral? And in a sense, uh, this work um, entirely came from, the, from us trying to complete this picture and aligning a better golden spiral to Dirk's better golden rectangle. And accidentally, in a sense, we created this entire machinery of being able to approximate uh, well, all the uh, logarithmic spirals. I say, all of them because, uh, and I refer you to the paper for this, but um, they, you have a relation between this uh, A value that I had in the, in the classical parameterization of any logarithmic spiral and this S value that we use for the slope. So you can transform one into the other, depending on uh, what perspective you'd like to take this um, diagonal uh, starting construction or the parameterization. But yeah, the, the original idea came from, from this paper of Doug. Okay, thanks. Very welcome. Thanks, Martin. Uh, let's thank our speaker again and share. Thanks, guys. Go ahead and start sharing.